Okay. Is everybody, I hope everybody can hear me. Welcome from me. Um, thanks for joining this. I'll get on with it because it's, uh, it's turned, well turned one o'clock now. I hope this is interesting. Um, there are plenty of pictures so I've got to keep you entertained. Um, I'll, I'll try to give you time to look at them uh, before I flip to the next one. Um, I, I am aware of the time and I'll try and finish hopefully at two o'clock. I'm aiming for that. Questions, uh, I think at the end, uh, written ones might be best. And then like Greg did in the last Zoom meeting, I can, I can run through them. Okay, um, I ought to just declare, first of all, that in a previous life, for the rest of the, the rest of my life before now, I was a lecturer in art history, which is, which is why, to some extent, I'm looking at pictures of the Civil War. I've been reading Noah Andre Trudeau's books about the Overland Campaign and the Siege of Petersburg and so on, and these are these. These books are, are two of the only ones I've come across, which are exclusively illustrated with uh, newspaper artists' drawings. These newspaper artists were known as special artist correspondents, um, or sometimes just specials. Uh, in in um, Trudeau's book, Bloody Road South, which is about the Overland campaign, he writes this at the beginning. He writes, the newspapers in the 1860s brought the Civil War into the parlours of America as much as television brought Vietnam into its living rooms in the 1960s. Accurate timely reportage replaced partisan politicking and dilettantism as the driving force of the American newspaper industry. And often as not, that coverage was visual as well as verbal. For alongside the many hard-working field correspondents who toiled, um, the, sorry, I've, I've misread the quote, the hard-working field correspondents toiled a, a smaller but equally dedicated core of combat artists who captured images of the great struggle in ink, charcoal and paint. For me, Trudeau says, these images have a vitality and a presence that complement perfectly the words of the soldiers themselves. <clears throat> Trudeau suggesting that in order to understand the war, the drawings can provide evidence alongside the diaries and the written accounts and the letters and the official documents and dispatches and, and all the other documentation that he and many of us use um, when we, we, we look at the Civil War. For those of us like, like all of us who have an interest in this war, the written evidence generally takes precedence and the drawings generally take a back seat. I want to try and redress that to some extent if I can. The problem is, and the same problem is with written evidence as well, the problem is that do the drawings provide accurate evidence of the war and this is one of the things I should be looking at. Visual evidence of the Civil War takes essentially two forms. The first form of course is photography. Um, the second form is drawing. This is the same bridge by the way, that's O'Sullivan's Chesterfield Bridge in the Overland Campaign at North Anna River. And this is Alfred Ward's drawing. By the way, I'll be talking about Alfred Ward and not Alfred Wode, as is sometimes said. Uh, his family, I have it on the best authority from Gary Edelman. Um, his family used the uh, pronunciation Ward, not Wode. Um, a drawing like this was made accessible to the wider public because it was an engraving was then made from it. There's the engraving from Ward's drawing, which was then published in, as you can see from the captioning, published in Harper's Weekly. Of these two forms, that is photography and drawing, these two visual forms, it would seem that the more reliable way of recording something is photography because it's a direct copy of reality. But 
there are problems in the 19th century with photography. Uh, a photograph like this is fine, um, but it, it, the subject has to be fairly static or posed. Um, if the subject moves, then you get blurring because the exposure times for photography uh, are slow. Anything from a couple of seconds to 20 seconds, depending on, on the light. So certain subjects were difficult to photograph because of these relatively lengthy exposure times. So for example, if we go back to this photograph, if you look left of center, you'll see just left of center, you'll see the horses, the cavalry crossing. And if we take a detail of that, you can see the blurring that's, that's happening. And that's because those guys are moving on their horses. The other problem with photography is that the, the equipment was cumbersome. Um, and it also took a long time to set up. You had to unpack the equipment, set up the camera, then you had to coat the glass plates, and then they had to develop, to be developed, and, and so on. And, and, and the other possible problem with photography is, as William Frasinito says in, in those wonderful books that he wrote about Antietam and Gettysburg and the Overland campaign, uh, that some photographs, this is the most famous example, um, are in fact not that authentic. I mean, they're authentic in the sense this is a, this is a corpse, but the corpse has been moved to this position and the musket has been put there as a prop to make the thing probably more dramatic. Most importantly, of course, is that photographs could not be reproduced in newspapers. The technology for doing that hadn't been invented. The first photograph didn't appear in a newspaper, well, the first true photograph didn't appear in a, an American newspaper till 1880. Um, in fact, photographs taken during the Civil War had a very limited circulation. They were either sold individually as private portraits or carte de visites, they were printed as carte de visites, or as stereo cards, um, or they were seen in exhibition. So it was pretty limited. Um, of course, drawings, the second visual form, have their shortcomings as well. Um, a drawing is created over a period of time, so the reality that a drawing depicts can change as a drawing is being made. And, and by their very nature, drawings are subjective, consciously or subconsciously influenced by a variety of things. For example, the artist's technical competence. If we look at this drawing by one of the specials, Edward Mullen, um, who worked for uh, Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper, look at the scale, for example, of the uh, firing squad compared to the outlined figures on the right and certainly compared to the line of figures which sort of disappears off behind the generals or whatever stood. And, and there's, a, there's an odd feeling of scale in this. I mean, yes, it shows us something that um, is important in the war and, and a record of what went on and so on, but it, the scale is a bit odd. When we compare it, for example, with that, which is an Alfred Ward drawing, the technical skill in that of, of Ward over, over Mullen is considerable and, and it's more believable. So we're, we're more likely to perhaps to believe this. Um, another example of subjectivity in, in drawings would we might call artistic license. For example, an artist might dramatize a scene or you know, a subject or change parts of the drawing to make the drawing more pleasing. This is a drawing I used in that article that, that Mike mentioned in, in Crossfire. And uh, I tried to prove in, in that article that this drawing was probably not done on the spot by Ward, although it's got a sketchy appearance and looks as though it might have been. Um, but in fact, when you, you, you take a line through the arm and the, the arms of the two figures and then the upper figure 
to the top, his, his name was Mahoney, was a, uh, the guy who was killed, um, and then down through there, through his leg, and then through the leg of that figure. There's this pyramidal sort of composition, which Ward uses quite a lot. And Ward was a trained artist, and, and he would have learned to do compositions in this way. But, but it's, it's, it's just a, an example of what might be moving figures around and positioning to artistic license. Um, in some cases, artists like Ward and others were sent messages by their editors uh, to, to draw particular things um, because editors were not so interested in um, editors of the, of the the newspapers these went into were not so interested in uh, how artistic the image looked perhaps but they were interested in they needed another battle scene <laughs> they needed something more dramatic to sell more newspapers one supposes but for the newspapers themselves there was no competition between photographs and drawing I mean they couldn't reproduce the photographs anyway so so drawings won hands down um, and the other thing is that drawings because of the way photography was, drawings could depict a whole wider range of things than photographers could show. And, and unlike the photographers with their wagon and all their equipment and so on, um, all the, the artists needed was a sketchbook and a pencil, I suppose, and a, and a horse to travel around in, on. And, and uh, this is a, a number of sketches by Arthur Lumley. Um, and, and done on the whole, I would think, on the spot. Uh, drawings like this one, which looks fairly finished, were done so that they could be sent off to newspapers and reproduced. Now, what I want to do now is just have a quick look at the newspapers, um, and uh, because I think it's important to know about some of the background to these drawings and, and what they were intended for. This is front page of the New York Times from 1862 and you'll notice there's well there is an illustration on the on the right hand side uh, a map very simple drawing um, but the, the daily papers this is a daily paper daily papers didn't have illustrations it was too expensive but in the 1850s um, illustrated papers started to be produced in America. Um, they were inspired by this publication, the Illustrated London News, which began its life in 1842 and, and lasted up until 2003, in fact. Um, uh, in America, uh, the Illustrated Papers didn't begin until the first one is 1855, and that's Frank Leslie's Illustrated newspaper on the left. You'll notice, by the way, if you look at the captions, all the dates are the same. So all these newspapers, including the Illustrated London News and these two and the next two I'm going to show you, are from September, 27th September, 62. These were weeklies. Um, so there was time to get the illustrations into them. Um, the Frank Leslie's, by the way, began in 1855. It lasted till 1922. And in 1860, it had a circulation of about 100,000. Harper's Weekly began two years later, 1857, lasted till 1916. And its circulation in 1860 was about 60,000. The other two news, major newspapers, one was the New York Illustrated News, which began in 1859 and only lasted till 64, 1864. Um, when it was renamed the Demorest New York Illustrated News and I can't find a date when that finished um, and the other one and, and, and again you'll see there they've got illustrations on, on the front and, and inside but the one on the right the Southern Illustrated News which was a Confederate paper uh, began in 1862 and, and ended with the Confederacy in 65 and that only had one illustration on the cover and it was usually the picture of a general or somebody in this case it's it's Stuart um, and it, it was a very limited illustrated newspaper now these newspapers uh, the the three other than not the, the London one but the three 
other than the uh, southern one were, were produced in New York. And, and these things were big business. They were big business, massive circulations, really. This is Harper's Weekly's building, photographed about 1870, so after the war. Massive building. And this is a, a, an engraving of a cross section of what was going on in that building. Um, they employed writers, editors, engravers, compositors, machinists, cleaners, everything. I mean, it really was big business. And, and of course, they employed writer correspondents and artists, special artist correspondents for specials. This is a double page spread from Harper's um, in 1864, drawn by Thomas Nast. And, and you can see in the middle at the bottom a sketchbook, an artist's sketchbook. And then the other images in the little vignettes, uh, little triptych vignettes, uh, show writers. And maybe the one on the left shows an artist drawing. It's difficult to tell. But it's called, as you see at the top, the press on the field. So correspondents going out and reporting on the war following the armies and artists following the armies. And this one is again from Harper's, uh, a section of a page, double page spread, I think. And, and it's Winslow Helm, a famous artist, certainly after, during and mainly after the war, great artist, painter. But he was a correspondent during the war. And it says underneath, you can see under his foot, uh, a special artist. And uh, you can see his drawing on the left-hand side, two six feet seven soldiers, they're, they're these tall guys. And, and he's actually there sketching in the field or camp or whatever it was. So there are images of them. When the artists had made these drawings uh, on, in the field, they sent them back to New York. Um, this is Alfred Ward's drawing of the army mail and uh, there is an there's an engraving of this as well in published in harper's but they, they send them back by the army mail or they send them back by dispatch rider courier on on horse uh, and it took at least a couple of weeks for the newspapers to engrave the drawings make an engraving of the drawings and uh, print them so so the the events of any one day they weren't in the newspapers till at least at least two weeks later. This is the engraving room at Harper's. Um, they look as though they're bookbinding here rather than engraving, so I'm, but it's listed in the image I got. This says engraving room at Harper's. Um, so all these guys are working away uh, on blocks of wood, carving into the blocks of wood. Now, I'll tell you about that in a minute. Well, I'll tell you now. This is a drawing by Alfred Ward. Um, made at Fredericksburg and then this is the wooden block made by an engraver back in New York from the drawing and you will immediately see if I go back to the drawing you see the way around so the guys with the wire are running from uh, right to left and here they're going because when you print it prints the right way around of course so it all had to be done backwards um, and, and um, there's the engraving that came from it in Harper's. The, um, the engraver would, would have a block of wood, quite a thick block of wood, very smooth, of course, on the surface. And then they would cut away with engraving tools. Um, and the bits they cut away would not print. So the bits that were left raised up would print. And if we look at a detail of these guys' legs, and bodies. You can see that in order to get light and shade, they use what's called hatching, that is lots of lines raised up. And, and when they wanted darker areas, they would use cross hatching lines raised up going the other way as well. So, and, and then in some areas, they didn't cut away so deeply. So if you look on the jacket of the, the figure at the front, you'll see a sort of darker tone um, and, and then if you compare that with the other side of his jacket where there's a lighter tone, the, the cutting away um, for, the, um, for, the, uh, for the semi dark tone on the right hand side of the jacket 
hasn't been as great as on the other side. So, so when the thing was put in, was rolled with ink, some of that area would pick up some of the ink. But basically what you're dealing with here is a linear reproduction of a drawing. So it's a simplified version in, in that sense. When they had more complex drawings or they wanted to produce engravings which were larger than you know a, a half a page or whatever they would square up the drawing and you can see in this drawing by Henry Lovey um, that they've squared up the drawing and then they would have a team of engravers each engraver doing a separate block and they'd have a master engraver keeping an eye on all, all his workers making sure that all the blocks lined up because when they where they cut all the blocks they bolted or screwed them all together to make one big block and printed that and you can just see in this the white squared up lines where the blocks have joined together just about in the sky particularly for example maybe a little bit in the water on the left hand side for example next to the one two three fourth fourth boat along before you get that little tugboat thing there's a white line there and that's where the blocks have been joined up. This is another wood block um, from the uh, New York Illustrated News of a sort of map. And you can see it's, it's in bad, bad condition, the block, and then below the print made from it. And again, you can see the white lines where they join them up. And this is another one. Um, I think I don't know how many blocks there are here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 12 blocks. Um, that's the block on the left, all the blocks joined together on the left, and then the print made from it in the Christmas edition, or the January edition of, of Harper's. When they had a really big um, image to do, they would use something called electrotype. So they, they'd, the wood block would be put together with the, the type, the letterpress the print and they then press hard wax onto it to make a mold a negative mold uh, which they then dusted with graphite lead pencil you know graphite and and this would give an electrically conductive surface then they put the whole thing as you can see the guys doing here into a vat of copper sulfate and they'd stick a piece of copper in there and then they'd pass an electrical charge through it um, and, and the negatively charged graphite would attract the positively charged copper ions that were coming off the copper off the copper piece and a copper skin would be formed on the wax mold then they'd take the skin out and uh, remove the skin from the mold and then they'd fit that because it was a thin piece of metal they'd fit that to these great rollers and they'd print the pages. This is the press room at Frank Leslie's illustrated. Now, so th this is the process that they were they were working towards. The art. Let's get back to the artists. The, these illustrated papers employed difficult to know, but around about three hundred artists to record the wall. About two thousand drawings were engraved and published. But there were tens of thousands of drawings that were made by the artists on the spot and in the field uh, that were never seen by the publishers. They weren't sent back. Artists might do quick sketches. They might do drawings that they wanted to do and not send back. Or, or they did drawings because, and because they were interested in something uh, for pleasure. Or, or they did drawings which were rejected by, by the editors. Being a special, was not a cushy number. Um, being a special was a hard life, really. Um, this is a drawing by Alfred Ward, and it shows Frank Vizitelli riding next to Dan Sickles early on in the war. Um, and uh, the, the, the correspondent artists traveled, often traveled with, with the armies. Um, Visitelli in 1862 switched sides, we might say, and went south. He got smuggled from Maryland in, into the south. 
and uh, threw in his lot with, with the Confederacy. But all other correspondence artists, specials, were working for Northern, for the North, working for Northern newspapers. So you might argue that the drawings are done from a Northern point of view, though if you take what Trudeau said, they, 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 they tried to be as objective as possible. And, and I think that's probably true. Ward, Alfred Ward, is now the most famous of these specials. Here he is photographed by O'Sullivan at Gettysburg, um, at Devil's Den, uh, posing uh, two or three days after the battle. Um, Ward was trained, as I said, in, in an art school. He went to the School of Design, which was in Somerset House in those days, and, and he immigrated to the States in 1850. In, by 1860, he was working for the New York Illustrated News, but then in 1961 he landed a job as a special with, with Harper's Weekly. Here he is on the left, sitting on the left, um, given as a profile shot, this is my best side sort of image, um, with the Army of the Potomac. General Meade's aide-de-camp, Theodore Lyman, wrote in May 1864, I quote, Friend Ward is along and with us, with us still and sojourns with the engineers. He draws for Harper's Weekly very good sketches he sends to them and, and very poor woodcuts they make of them. So, so I don't think Lyman was particularly uh, um, impressed with the woodcuts but he liked the, the drawings. Like many specials, uh, Ward um, wanted to be close to the action because he could get the best drawings, I suppose, for the newspaper. Um, and he's known to have carried a pistol, just in case there was trouble. Um, and he sometimes did find himself in difficulty, although he always managed to escape injury. This is a pass written by um, Captain John Wilson of Company A, 50th Regiment, Georgia Volunteers, um, at Centerville because Ward got himself stuck behind Confederate lines. And, and the, the, this little piece of paper reads, the bearer Alfred R. Ward, having entered Confederate lines under a flag of truce, has permission to return to the Federal lines. I mean, this tells us he was willing to do that, but it also tells us that he, he wanted to maybe draw uh, something from the other side, the Confederate side. Ward, as far as I know, was not injured in the war, but other specials weren't as fortunate. Um, there's no original drawing for this, but the engraving um, is by, well, is by, from a drawing by, as it says, sketch by James O'Neill. Um, and sadly, O'Neill was killed in October 1863 by Quantrill's guerrillas. Um, he's, as far as I know, the only special to have died during the war of, in combat or whatever, um, but many were injured. This is Theodore Davis, um, and Davis wrote, there is still a reminder uh, of an incident um, where he was shot at, in fact, in the form of a scar on my left knee, as large as a half dollar made by the bullet that killed my horse. And this, Edwin Forbes. Uh, after the battle of Second Battle of Manassas, this is a drawing done in that battle by Forbes. Forbes wrote, I was in the hottest of the fire for quite a while. When I attempted to get away, I found myself I found myself cornered. I started with a party of skirmishers through a dense road leading my horse, and after passing under a severe fire of shell, I got a safe position. And Edwin Forbes again, writing to his editor at Frank Leslie's newspaper, I send you a batch of sketches, he writes, which I'm sure will interest your readers. They have been taken at considerable risk, for the country is overrun with small gangs of sneaking secessionists who are bloodthirsty or as bloodthirsty as Albert Pike. For one day, I got an escort of 10 men and made some sketches in comparative safety. And this is a drawing by Henry Lovey. 
Lovey came from Cincinnati and his hometown newspaper, the Cincinnati Daily Gazette, reported that Mr. Lovey was a running target for sentries who mistook him for an enemy scout. Fortunately, their aim was not so good. And this is John Hillen, again working for Leslie's, Frank Leslie's. Hillen was captured at Chickamauga and then was badly wounded during Sherman's Atlanta campaign. He was in the army, but he was also freelancing for Frank Leslie's newspaper. On the back of this drawing, he writes, or he wrote, our men supplying the prisoners with bread and tobacco. Quite different from the treatment our men receive from the Rebs. The dangers in battle were one thing, but there were also other dangers. Um, Harper's Weekly's Theodore Davis, special artist, was detained in Memphis at the beginning of the war. Um, and he wrote this ironic report uh, to accompany this image that he made. On his arrival in Memphis, special artist Theodore Davis was awaited upon by the vigilance committee who inquired who he was, where he came from, what he was do doing, where he was going, and whether he didn't need any hanging. Having obtained answers to these various questions, the committee then proceeded to inspect Mr. Davis's trunk. Finding at the bottom a number of sketches, they examined them minutely and each member, by way of remembering Mr. Davis, pocketed two or three of the most striking drawings. As the only revenge Mr. Davis could take on these polite highway robbers, he sketched them in the act of despoiling him. As well as the dangers of battle, of people like this threatening to hang him because he was from the north, specials also faced, special artists also faced other hardships. Henry Lovey was continually complaining about these hardships. Um, on the reverse of this drawing, he writes, skirmishing at Bellington showed the daring courage of the Indiana and Ohio troops. The Cincinnati Commercial and Gazette have correspondence. Get the facts from these papers. I'm nearly worn out. No sleep and long rides have made me very tired. I have to send letters by chance messengers. So he's moaning that he's not got time or he's worn out, too worn out to write a report on this, this action. Get the information from the local newspaper. And here again, oh sorry, here again in 1862, Lovey writes to his, this, by the way, sorry, this drawing, the engraving is on the right hand side of the drawing. Um, they're in snow, they're wading through snow. Um, in, in 1862, Lovey wrote to his editor at Frank Leslie's, I must beg a furlough for rest and repairs. I'm deranged about the stomach, ragged, unkempt and unshorn, and need the conjoined skill and services of the apothecary, the tailor and the barber, and above all the attentions of home and the cheerful prattle of children, who, by this time, would almost have forgotten that they had a father. Another, this is another uh, engraving done from a Henry Lovey drawing of, a, of him um, with, a, with people guiding him through the snow, soldiers I think. Another of Leslie's specials wrote back to the newspaper, our diet is simple if not cheap, consisting of hardship, hard, hardship biscuits harder tongue, salt tongue, and coffee without milk or sugar. And to this, that we have to take, sorry, add, sorry, add to this, that we have to take a big dose of quinine every morning to keep off the fever. That sand flies and mosquitoes are abundant and of gigantic size. That our sleeping arrangements imply no blankets, which I neglected to bring and I cannot buy. Imagine all this and more, and you will form some notion of the delights of a special artist of the 
the mouth of the Mississippi. Despite all these dangers and all these problems and the complaints, in general, as I've already sort of said, special artists were dedicated and considered themselves as reporters rather than artists. In other words, they were conveying information rather than making pictures for pleasure. And many went to considerable lengths to do this. This is Francis Shell. And after Burnside had captured Roanoke Island in early 1862, a major Edgar Kimball of the 9th New York wrote to Frank Leslie's newspaper. I beg to say, he wrote, that your illustrations of the victories on Roanoke Island are very correct. I noticed, as so did the whole of the 9th Regiment, Mr. Shell, your artist, sitting on a log, sketching under the hottest fire from Fort Defiance. His nonchalance and coolness did as much toward inspiring our troops as the enthusiasm and bravery of any of the officers. Some subjects gave the specials plenty of time to draw them. This, for example, by Edwin Forbes. In fact, he writes on this, you can see, the tired soldier, a sketch from life. So this was done in front of the subject fairly quickly. I mean, the subject stayed very still for him, of course. And this one, a drawing by Arthur Lumley, um, Count Life, probably worked on the spot, although the ink wash, the, the greyer areas, that's ink thinned with water. I mean, the, the lines are done in, in, in pencil and ink, um, and, and then the water added to make the wash. And then the white paint, which was known as Chinese white, by the way, you'll see a number of the labels have that. Um, Chinese white is what we would call poster paint. It's, a, it's an opaque watercolour, or, or gouache, we might call it. Um, so that may have been added later along with maybe some of the washes but because of the scene because it it's tense and they're not going to move i mean the figures may do move so much but those are not going to move he may have done it from the spot completely um but of course some drawings were made during combat and and uh, these would have been more difficult to make because of the situation and and when they're made quickly, the drawings, like this one by Alfred Ward, they're totally unsuitable to be sent back as they are, as they exist, um, to the newspapers, because you couldn't make an engraving, not easily anyway, from something like that. So that was done presumably on the spot in combat at Gettysburg, and this one by Joe Becker um, was done at Poplar Springs in C.G. Petersburg and um, very quick pencil drawing as well. These quicker sketches that were done, we might think of as being more authentic than the more finished ones, but we'll see how that pans out as we, as we move on. Um, many of these drawings had written notes with them. Um, this one by James Taylor has, for example, and, and to some extent, these, these notes are for the artist because maybe at a later date, in fact, quite likely at a later date, the artist would back in his camp, back in his tent, wherever, he would then do another version of this, a more finished version, and, and he would need notes to help him be as accurate as possible in doing that second version. Or in some cases, if I go back to this, not that Ward did this, but you, the artist might draw over the top of this in a more finished way. But the notes, the written notes on these things were done for more detail. And, and sometimes the notes on these, this one done at Sharpsburg, you can see the notes at the bottom. By the way, on these drawings reproduced from New York Public Library, on the bottom left hand corner you see they've got printed on that's not part of the original drawing it's the library thing but you can see along the bottom all the notes and then there are other notes as well some of these notes may have been made 
by the artist from what he saw, so he could remember, but they may have been added from the artist talking to participants in the battle, in this case, um, and, and then one might argue, are they as valid or as authentic as, as just the artist writing notes? Well, I mean, I, I would argue they were. And, and this one by Henry Lovey at, at Shiloh, um, lots of notes on this. So, uh, you know, the, these notes, these, these sorts of sketches would never have found their way back to the newspapers. The most common way, as I've said, of making, well, I, I've intimated, of making a drawing to be sent back was for the artist to take his sketches back to his camp at night and redraw them uh, in a more finished way so that they, so that when they got back to New York, the engravers could, could make copies of them. Um, this is Theodore Davis and Davis wrote with this which was published in a, a much later magazine, as you can see, um, maybe not even done during the war, but nevertheless, um, it shows what he did during the war. He, he wrote uh, that he made sketches, which I quote, were often finished at night by no better light than that of the fire. They also used um, visual notes that they made and carried with them. So that, for example, Davis here was doing sketches of horses and saddles and stirrups and spurs and the like. And, and then he would use that as reference to when he made more finished drawings back in camp from the sketches he'd done on the spot. And the same on the right hand side with uniforms, Alfred Ward uh, sketches with notes and little drawings of, of uniforms, so that things were accurate in the final drawings. One way of creating a more finished drawing, which would be suitable for the engraver to make tonal effects using his hatching and cross hatching, was to use Chinese white highlights. In this case, to get the effects of, of uh, musket smoke, gun smoke. Um, it's very, un I mean, this sketch by Ward at the Battle of Winchester, the third, four, I don't know, the third battle, of, I'm guessing, Battle of Winchester, you will know better than me, um, it is, looks like it was done on the spot. It's very quickly drawn and it may well have been done on the spot, but the white paint to give it that greater atmosphere of the battle scene was probably added later fairly quickly. Um, it's very unlikely Ward carried a paint box around with him and water and, and a brush into battle um, or even had time to put the paint on. Um, but this looks like a first draft of a sketch which he may have worked up into a more finished piece to be sent off. This one is a more finished piece that he then sent off. This is at Fredericksburg um, and initially it may have been sketched out on the spot in front of the subject or the battle where well Humphreys was charging his regiments and some were charging. And, and then Ward has added some wash colour. He's added some Chinese white. He's also picked out with a slightly thicker watercolour paint, some darker areas. The, 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 the guy on the horse with the sword, the house in the distance, these figures in the mid ground and so on. Now this, was there, this particular drawing was sent back to Harper's and that's what they did with it. Yeah, that's what the engravers did with it. Um, it's not difficult to distinguish in these drawings which are quicker sketches and which, sorry, and which aren't. Uh, oh, this is a, just, sorry, this is another one by John Hillen, where he's probably drawn some of this on the spot and then worked it up using ink, brown ink wash over the top. And sometimes, um, very, very rarely, colour was used. This is the same drawing, by the way. So the top one um, is Fredericksburg, and then there's a close-up of the two houses on in the middle left, you can see. This is Frank Rizzitelli, um, and he's done a quick drawing, some, you know, and then he's worked on it later on. 
in all likelihood um, with with crayon and so on and lots of notes you notes as well now i said it's not difficult to know which are the quicker sketches and which aren't this is ward at fredericksburg again and it's when they were laying pontoons across the rappahannock and and uh, he's started to draw this on the spot i think probably hiding from somewhere because the confederates were barksdale's men once wasn't it who were firing across killing off the engineers um and then later on he's done a bit more work on it i think and he's added the white paint now if we compare this drawing with ward which i think is at least begun on the spot difficult to know but i would guess with this one by Kirk by chapel this is a much more finished drawing almost frameable this particular image and, and again chapel may well have drawn some of this on the spot very difficult to know or he may have done preparatory sketches or a sketch and but this one is clearly worked up um, at a later date it's a it's a, a highly finished drawing and, and would have taken you know hours i guess i guess to make um this one again a very finished drawing by andrew mccallum um but because it's a finished drawing we mustn't think that this wasn't done from observation in this particular case i think it probably was done from observation um, although a lot of the detail would have been added later and so on particularly the the lines in the sky of the the mortars directions and whatever's going on there um, because McCallum was aid, aide de camp to Brigadier General Orlando Wilcox um, and he was McCallum was assigned map, ma map making duties but he was also a freelance for Frank Leslie's newspaper um, from July 1864 when the siege of Petersburg was going on so he had first-hand experience he had plenty of time because Wilcox gave him time to do drawings like this um, and then this was sent off to Leslie's and that was printed that was the the engraving made from it fantastic piece of engraving that it seems to me that the gold standard of a drawing we can call an authentic sketch you know an authentic record of what went on is not just the on the spot sketch but also the works of drawings if uh, we, it would, we would imagine but um, would things be so simple no this is a drawing done by Ward I think it's when probably at Appomattox um, was it somebody surrendered didn't they to Custer a flag of truce was brought and it was it was Lee's letter I think to, to Grant I think anyway but you'll know better than me but anyway if we look at this quick drawing this is Custer um, just to the left of centre the highest of the figures on horses and you notice the Custer's horse is not finished now look at this same image so what Ward did I think was to sketch this maybe as quickly as it well as quickly as he could maybe on the spot and then to rework it as that and in this one he's repositioned the figure he's given us a much more pleasing composition arrangement of the figures within the rectangle of the paper and he's made it more legible as to what's going on the confederate riding up with the flag of truce and and so on and Custer and his minions waiting um, and if this you might think this example then confuses accuracy and truth and authenticity um, but the engravings published in the newspapers throw into focus as well the sometimes the pernicious influence of editors this is a Frank Vizitelli drawing and, and Frank Vizitelli I think writes about how he was like his life was in danger in at Fredericksburg um, he nearly got killed a man not far from him was shot and so on um, but when he sent this back to the illustrated London news in London this is what they did with it doesn't look like the same picture 
if you look at the house on the right hand side oh sorry i've gone the wrong way i beg your pardon there's that house and then the line of figures they are there but then it's it's been changed to some degree same is true of this edwin forbes cedar mountain there aren't many drawings of the battle cedar mountain or slaughter mountain and this is what the newspaper leslie's did with it <laughs> it's completely different so and this one is a lulu this is uh, henry lovey's wilson's creek drawing general lyon being shot chances are that lovey didn't see this but he probably had lots of I mean, maybe he did but lots of people telling him and in fact at the top you can see a little sketch of Lyons's hat and so on so he was after accurate detail and when he sent this back i assume he sent it back to uh leslie's newspaper newspaper they they didn't want to print it and what they did was got him to draw get him to draw another one and that's what they printed because they wanted a more dramatic melodramatic you could argue um image of of this early on in the war this general being killed so editorial censorship we could call it of sorts also played a part in the accuracy or inaccuracy inauthenticity of some of these drawings but there are a few instances not many i might think where the artists themselves um, didn't depict what they saw or to put it another way they depicted what they didn't see this is henry lovey now lovey these are confederates in the foreground lovey was a northern artist working for frank leslie's um he wasn't with the confederates at montreville um so he couldn't have drawn this from life and he couldn't have drawn it from life anyway it's it's too animated it's you know even a quick sketch and then working up from it you know it's so detailed but he could have drawn it from other people's evidence verbal evidence even prisoners evidence of what it was like and and he gets certain things right and he probably was at Montfordville, though he wasn't in this position the, the confederates had to charge through an abattis of um fallen trees and so on and then in the background you can see the, the the bridge over the green river with its three um brick piers which uh which is is accurate so he went for accuracy but he gave us a picture which he couldn't have seen really and this drawing by visitelli which i use in the article that mike mentioned in crossfire and i go to great lengths with evidence to prove that visitelli wasn't at chickamauga when this happened and in fact the the scene he sets it in wasn't the field that or wasn't the area where hood was wounded um he was there the next day visitelli and and he was taken across the battlefield by longstreet's adjutant moxley sorrel and and shown fields and he said well this is a nice field this looks good and he disappeared off and made a drawing and this is the drawing he made um and so it, it's accurate to a degree in fact it's got a lot of accuracies in it because he spoke to lots of people who or a number of people who saw this event so you know but it's not what he saw the same is true with with metzner's capture of general willick at stones river um Metzner was a captain in the 32nd Indiana, which was an old German regiment. Um, and uh, Willick's, General Willick's commander, Richardson, Richard Johnson, wrote this in his official report. About six o'clock, General Willick rode up to my headquarters, and while taking, uh, talking with me, a shot was fired. At once, Willick, start, Willick started at full speed to join his command and in his haste ran through his line his horse was killed and he was captured by the enemy and his valuable services were lost to us in fact willie galloped into uh, some Ar arkansans and and he turned his horse and tried to ride out of them but a cannonball exploded and, 
and shattered the horse's hind leg and he was then captured. Now Metzner could not have seen this, but some people did, I guess, and this is why he drew it. Or maybe he made it up, who knows? And this by Ward is, is almost certainly made up. Although there are, to a degree, factual accuracies. This is General Polk being killed um, on Pine Mountain. Uh, you can't say that Ward was stood next to Polk, Johnson and Hardy when the shell exploded and killed Polk, but he drew it. Um, and we have Hardy and Johnson walking away, which is, which is what happened. And the same with this by Ward of, of Reynolds, again, a, an image I use in the article in Crossfire. Um, the chances are, I mean, he may have been there when Humphreys was, uh, sorry, when Reynolds was shot, but it's like 99.9% .9 unlikely. Um, and, and if you read that piece, I, I put evidence forward for that. Um, on the back of this, interestingly, is this, a really detailed account of what went on and a map of what went on. Um, done obviously after the event. Um, this drawing, by the way, wasn't even submitted, as far as I know, to, to Harper's Weekly. It wasn't engraved in Harper's Weekly. And the death of Reynolds was, was something of a small obsession with Ward. He made an engraving of that drawing, or he, he had an engraving made, which then sold. I guess he took the profits from it and people would frame it and buy it, frame it, put it up. But he drew this as well. This is a little drawing, little sketch. Whether it was made in 1863 is anybody's guess of Reynolds being killed. And this was another one. And this wasn't made in 1863. This was made after 1880 and before Ward died in 1891 because this is drawn on the back cover of the magazine on the left, the salon. And that is dated 1888 or after. And we know that because on the cover of this, there's a little engraved drawing or lithographed, I don't know, drawing of this painting. And this painting wasn't made until 1880. So that drawing was done in Ward's, I won't call it his dotage, but in his later life. Strange, isn't it? And you know, it's got this sketchy feel to it with these two figures on the right side. And you think, well, it looks like a battlefield drawing, but it's not. But, oh, and, and one more. Oh no. Not one more. Um, despite all these examples, these few examples I've given you, I'm just coming to an end now, so don't despair. Um, the, there are drawings made, and many, 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 hundreds and hundreds of drawings made, which are really valuable documents, evidence of what the war was like. And in, in, in my view, as valuable as many of the written words. Um, this, for example, of a shell of, of Fort Donaldson. There aren't many drawings of Fort Donaldson. There's not much of a record, uh, visual record of Fort Donaldson at all. But this is a great image of what the guys looked like, what went on, and so on. Um, this one by Vizitelli. Vizitelli did, well, at least three drawings of the assault on... Uh, for Wagner. This is Glory, isn't it? The movie Glory. Am I right? Sure, you, you can tell me. Tell me at the end. Um, and, and, and on the back of this, look at this. This is on the back of many busy tally drawings. There are these written accounts because the, the, the illustrated London News often printed his written accounts as well. In this case, they didn't. On the, on the, the Fort, Fort Wagner one, they didn't. But that's a, his account of what went on. And, and that, although it's, you know, it's washed in and, you know, with ink wash and whatever, and, and um, Chinese white, etc. He was there, there's no doubt he saw this going on. 
And then this is a, a Lulu. This is Arthur Lumley when the, the, the Union forces went into Fredericksburg and sacked the place before the, the major assault on Murray's Heights and so on the next day. And this is just an amazing picture. And I, I've no doubt at all done on the spot. Very cool. And on the back of this, he writes this, on the back of that drawing, he writes this, Friday night in Fredericksburg. This night, the city was in the wildest confusion, sat by the Union troops, houses burned down, furniture scattered in the streets, men pillaging in all directions, a fit scene for the French Revolution and a disgrace to the Union Army. This is my view of what I saw, Lumley. Great, isn't it? And to finish, two images connected. This is a pass issued by uh, Marcena Mar Patrick, a Provost Marshal General to Alfred Ward. It reads as follows. Mr. A. R. Ward has permission to pass from these headquarters to within the lines of the armies, including Richmond and Petersburg, Virginia, for the purpose of artists sketching for Harper's. So Ward was the one special artist with the army at the end of the war, with Grant's, Meade's army chasing Lee to Appomattox. And without this pass, and without Alfred Ward, we wouldn't have had this absolutely fantastic remarkable image look at that how would we know what it was really like when lee and was it taylor who was with him rode away from the mclean house at appomattox that fantastic image it was never published it was never made into an engraving because uh, by the time they could get this done Lincoln had been shot and the, the Harpers was full and they were all full of images of, uh, of Lincoln. <laughs>